Hey YouTube, it's me, Anna. I am here to film my birth story, hi, of Mr. Frederick Walter. That's him. Yeah, can you say hi? Oh, you look so sad. Don't be sad. Yeah. Um, so, first, I will tell you just the abbreviated version, the clean version, I guess. Uh, none of the hairy details because it will get hairy. <laughs> um, so Frederick was born on September 22nd, 2017 at 12.49 a.m. He was 21 inches long and weighed 8 pounds and 15 ounces. Huge. Um, a little, like, here's my abbreviated birth story. My uh, water broke on the 19th, early in the morning, 4 a.m. And then, since I was a TOLAC, which is trial of labor after cesarean, um, hoping for my VBAC and my water broke. Also, I was GBS positive, group B strep positive. I had to have an IV full of um, um, antibiotics. Oh, gosh. And I was basically a full induction because I didn't have any contractions, any consistent or strong contractions when I got to the hospital. So I was like a full induction and it did not work out in my favor. <laughs> I ended up getting a cesarean. Um, and that's okay. I'm not, I don't feel like a failure. I don't feel like birth was ripped from me. Um, I labored for 44 hours, so I got a taste of the of the world of birthing <laughs> vaginally. So, so yeah, I got a taste of that. All right, so here is my long birth story with all of the hairy details. Let me get my phone because I wrote notes, and I also um, filmed little clips while things were happening. So. I might be like jump cutting to back then and inserting little clips of me uh, laboring at home or laboring in the hospital, all those things. So ah, this will be a multi-part birth story, FYI. And if you've had a traumatic birth experience, just know that this video might be a trigger for you. Um, Hi. So September 19th, um, the night before, so September 18th at the, in, in the evening, blah, um, I was bouncing on the birthing ball and I was just like, you know, let's get him in position, let's get him down, we're doing this, this is going to be great. And I felt this really weird sensation, like I felt like he dropped way down. Um, I even said to my husband, oh my gosh, he's in my vagina. <laughs> because I thought like that is a very new sensation and it felt like heavy pressure right there. So it was weird. I uh, hooked up my Spectra S2 breast pump and I hooked it to myself for 20 minutes, both sides, and was trying to get contractions going that way. Um... We did some BDing, uh, and then I put some evening primrose oil up in there. Uh, so uh, I wrote here in my notes, I'm so happy it worked, because on the 19th at 4 a.m., <laughs> or no, I'm sorry, on the 20th at 4 a.m., dang it, <laughs> at 3 a.m., I woke up feeling weird, like gassy, but I also had to pee. And then I couldn't sleep after that. I was like tossing and turning and I was like, is that gas? It feels weird, Ugh. And so I kept getting up and going to the bathroom. Um, so I woke up at 3 a.m., 3.30, and then um, tossing and turning at 4.30, my water broke. And it felt weird. I was laying on my left side and I felt this like, that's how I could describe it, almost silent. That's how it felt. Um, almost like a gas bubble, but um, like I felt some warmth, not warmth, 
I just felt like some wetness. And so I was like, oh, that's weird. I felt that like sound or feeling and then kind of wetness. So I was like, eh, I gotta get up. I should get up. I should get up fast because if this is my water breaking, it's gonna be like, <sighs> because I, I didn't like flood the bed. I was surprised. So I got up as fast as I can at almost 40 weeks pregnant. I got up super fast and then gush, I felt this like rush of water just flood out of me. Um, and that's when I started screaming, Doug, my water broke, Doug, my water broke. Ah, my water broke. So I'm like waddling super fast to the bathroom and I'm sitting on the toilet and he comes in and I'm like, my water broke. Oh my gosh, my water broke. Oh my gosh. And he's like, oh, um, huh? I like, he's so out of it when I wake him up in the middle of the night. So he was just like, huh? And I'm like, that's not me peeing. That's my water, my amniotic fluid. It's, it's dripping into the, to, to, into the toilet. Oh my gosh. I have to take a shower. I don't know when the next time I'm gonna take a shower is. Ah, this is happening. So I was super excited. And I hop in the shower and uh, contractions started happening pretty close together, between two and a half and five minutes apart. Um, kind of strong. Um, yeah, and I was really bad about telling him when they were getting better. Um, so I would be like, oh, having a contraction. But then I would just like deal with the pain. So they were lasting like 30 seconds, not very long. And then start talking to him again and he's like, oh wow, this is a long contraction. And I'm like, oh, it's been over for a while. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, he told me, so I'm like sitting there in the shower, like breathing through the contractions and washing my hair, all that stuff. And he's like, okay, well, I'm gonna go back to bed. And I was like, oh no, you're not. <laughs> like you have to text everyone. So that's what he did. He texted my in-laws who were scheduled to come like in a few days. Um, I think the day, his, uh, his due date, they were flying in or she was flying in on the 23rd. So in a few days they were supposed to be here and I was like, Tell her it's happening, oh my gosh. Um, call my doula, like call the midwife. I want everybody to know. And so that's what he did. He was like, oh, okay. I didn't know this was serious. And I'm like, it's serious. <laughs> um, so then he was like, he was up. He brought me breakfast at 5.30 and my coffee and cause I knew I wasn't gonna eat like a real meal. So I had like a muffin and coffee, it was fine. <laughs> And then we waited for my daughter to wake up. And she usually wakes up between like six and seven. And I got her fed by 6.50 or 6.30, sorry. And then we dropped her off at my friend's um, place at 6.50. And I wanna just pause there because up until like his birth, that was the hardest part. Leaving my two and a half year old that I've never left with anyone overnight before. Um, I didn't know how long I was gonna be in the hospital. Spoiler alert, five days. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I didn't know how long I was gonna be away from her and it was just rough. Like I wanted to just bawl my eyes out. Um, I tried to like be strong, but I definitely was like, I love you. And she was going to my friend's house that had kids her age and like loves, loves my, fan, my my friends over there. So she was kind of getting excited and distracted and once she did get distracted, we left. We were like, no prolonged hugs, kisses. I already gave her my kisses and my hugs in the car. Like we can't, we're not gonna be doing like this big drawn out thing where she's gonna have meltdown. She did ask for me um, during the day and my friend took videos of her like jumping on rocks and running and like it was really sweet to get sort of like checked in with her throughout the day. I was like, I'm not gonna like do a Google Hangout or anything with her because I don't want her to see me and then like have this major fit. Even though I want to see her so badly, I was just so thrilled that my friend, she understands that. She's a mom of two, like she gets it. Um, she understood that I needed to see her 
Oh, so it was really nice, even though I wanted to cry. Oh, and I want to cry right now just thinking about it. So we got to the hospital at 8, and um, I went straight to labor and delivery. I didn't even stop at registration because I did pre-registration. So I figured, like, I'm good. Let me just bypass all these people. So I get checked in, and I'm like, my water broke. I'm GBS positive, group B strep positive. Um, I'm a TOLAC, trial of labor after cesarean. So, like, we're going to have a good time. <laughs> And she was like, okay, well, we have to test to make sure it's amniotic fluid. And um, I was like, fine, that doesn't, it's like all gush, wet, like bleh, down there. So she's like, I just have to use like a dry cotton swab. And so she's like, this part's kind of painful. And I was like, that's a dry cotton swab is not going to like even register because it's like so much fluid down there. Oh, it did. It hurt. And I was like, ah. And she was like, sorry, honey. This is this is hard. I know. Um, she was great. She had like a hundred kids. I don't know. I think she had four or six kids. I don't remember exactly. But <clears throat> she was like, you know, for me, the IV was the hardest part. And, and I was like, let me tell you, I've had issues with IVs before. So, um, you know, I might be a heart stick. My veins might roll, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, okay, well... You know, if I can't get it, I can't get it, but I feel confident that I'll be able to. And two pokes in, she got my IV started. Um, it was in my wrist, like, I uh, can't point to it because uh, baby's right there, but like right where my cuff sort of ends, um, that's where my IV was for five days. Um, so a little bit of an annoying of a placement, but oh well, you know, it, it got in and I was like, okay. You are a magical nurse. You got my IV in. I didn't have to have lidocaine or that weird ultrasound machine that shows you where the veins are. Like, it was easy. So I was like, okay, I'm excited. This is working. <laughs> so, uh, when I got checked in, um, oh, the, the cotton swab came back that it was positive for amniotic fluid. Duh. <laughs> but anyway, um, the baby's heart rate was high. So it was like in the 170s, I want to say, and they want to see it in 165. Um, sorry, I'm saying um a lot. Uh, <laughs> so we started um, IV fluids for me because they said that that would help with the baby's heart rate, and it did. It brought it down. It was good. My midwife was actually on call, the one that I wanted <laughs> so bad. She had tiny hands. So I was like, ooh, tiny hands. Cervical checks will be awesome. <laughs> like, I'm happy for that. I didn't get a cervical check until 7.30 at night. So, like, very, very, very long time. Um, she was there and she was like, FYI, this is the hardest way to have a baby. When your water breaks, you're a toe lack, you have no contractions starting. Um, you're kind of on a clock, but not, not like, you know, at 24 hours you will get a C-section. It's more like everything has to be golden for you to continue this method of induction. And so I started rattling off things like, okay, let's try Cervidil, Cytotec. Yeah, let's do the Foley bulb. So I'm like telling her all these things, like, let's try this. And she was like, Cervidil's too strong, Cytotec's too strong um, for a VBAC. It's too much on your uterus. The only method is Pitocin that's like a drug. Um, you could do the natural stuff first, which we will try. So don't get too excited. Like, we're gonna try hooking you up to a breast pump, walking around, we're gonna get this started. So I was like, okay, I'm excited. Um, so, so yeah, she told me it was, you know, the hardest, the Foley bulb couldn't go up in there to dilate me because I had my waters broken, <sighs> which is so annoying. And that should have gotten me to like three to four centimeters within like two to four hours, I think they put it in there for, or maybe they put it in for eight hours. I'm not sure, but it's pretty fast, the processes, and I heard painful, but... I wouldn't know. So she said, 
Uh, this is a full-on induction, sorry, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's the cards we were dealt. So she put me on 2020 cycles, three of them, and it was supposed to be 20 minutes of pumping, 20 minutes of walking around. I was only supposed to be monitored for those 20 minutes that I was hooked up to the breast pump, and then I had 20 minutes of freedom. So I was like, yes, let's do this. My nurse misunderstood what she said, so she made me do 20 minutes of nursing, 20 minutes of rest, and then 20 minutes of walking. So basically like, let's get it started. Oh, let's calm down. Okay, let's try again. So really, really stunting my progression. Um, my midwife came in and was like, what? No, this is taking way longer than it should. You should be like on your last cycle. And I was like in the middle of my, I think I was in the middle of my third cycle actually. <clears throat> but she's like, you should have been done for an hour. And I was like, well, I'm not. Um, so that kind of stunk. And like one of my kind of rude requests was like, please don't give me that nurse again. Um, but that was okay. At 7.30, they started me on Pitocin and I kind of had a little meltdown. I was like, oh no, <laughs> don't put me on Pitocin. Like um, I had such a bad reaction when I was, um, after I delivered Cecilia, my brain is like in a fog. Um, they gave me Pitocin and then the anesthesiologist was like, whoa, can you stop the Pitocin? She's having every side effect. And I remember feeling kind of like faint, but kind of like out of breath and like just out of sorts and weird. And the midwife explained to me that after surgery, they pump you like with a ton of Pitocin to stop bleeding. And they were gonna start me at like a one, and that big dose that I got in the hospital was probably like a 30. Um, so they were like, you know, we're starting like way low. We don't wanna risk anything with you being a VBAC. So I agreed to Pitocin. I was like, you know, I want to um, be more dilated and I want to just experience what labor's like because my my monitoring was like so difficult. I had to lay on my left side and press the monitor to my side or have somebody press it to me. And while they were doing that, um, I did nap for like 15 minutes. <clears throat> um, but I could nap, like I could nap through my contraction. So it was not like a big deal. <sighs> so at 7.30, they started the Pitocin, they checked my cervix for the first time. I was one centimeter. So I was like, oh, dang it, that's what I was in the office for my check. Ugh. So then September 21st rolls around. Um, I was in bed, kind of like stuck in bed with those, those monitors because of Pitocin being started, because um, they couldn't put any sort of wireless monitor on me to walk around because it would just, uh, they wouldn't hear the baby, feel the baby at all. So <laughs> even though this hospital had wireless monitoring, I couldn't do it. So they were like, we could do internal monitors once you get to about two centimeters. And I was like, great, sign me up because I wanna get out of bed. I wanna like actually help my body do this. And so, um, uh, internal monitoring like kind of freaked me out when I took the birthing class with Cecilia uh, because it's like this little coil that gets screwed into the top layer of the skin of the head of the baby and then <clears throat> there's another tube that goes up there that um, uh, measures the pressure of your contraction so you get really good data like you get exactly the heart rate, you get exactly how strong your contractions are. Like it's, it's pretty awesome, science is cool. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I was stuck in bed. I called it bed rest, but really I was just like stuck in bed. My hip was like on fire because I had to be on my left side for the monitor to work. It was so annoying. So had to be in bed until 1.30 a.m. on September 21st and then I was two centimeters. And uh, she got the monitors up and I was so happy. The thing about monitors are you have tubes, you have wires, 
hanging out of your stuff. So uh, going to the bathroom was a little difficult. Um, you were basically just peeing all over these wires. It was weird. Um, and then we like, it was already taped to my leg, but then we also taped it to like my hip and like I had this, because if you pull it, like that's the end of the world. Um, you don't touch the monitors, like that's a big deal. Sitting was kind of awkward. I mean, by kind, kind of, I mean like really awkward because you're sitting on these wires. Um, so I hated being on the birthing ball. I just was super uncomfortable. I did labor on the ball for a little bit and I would mostly just like rock my hips back and forth and moan. Like that's how I get through my contractions. Um, I was doing like the breathing techniques, but I was going like and like clenching my teeth and I'm like, I need to like loosen my jaw. So <clears throat> thank you, Ina Mae Gaskin. Gaskin? Yeah. Um, because that tip came from her. Then I opened my mouth and I would just go, uh, <laughs> and I kind of sounded like a goat, <laughs> like, uh, the whole time that I was having painful contractions. My backup doula was there because my doula had a family emergency. So she was like watching the monitor and she was like, okay, you're on the other side. Okay, it's all downhill from now, you're good. You should be feeling relief. And that was actually really helpful. I, she would sort of acknowledge that it was happening and then she'd tell me as soon as like the peak. So now it is 7 a.m. and there's a new shift. Um, and the new doctor on call was like, I feel comfortable being more aggressive with the Pitocin. At this point, the Pitocin was at a nine out of 10. That's what the first OB told me he would feel comfortable going up to. The new one was like 15 or more, let's do it. So I decided that morning that I was just so exhausted from being up for so long and dealing with the contractions, the very unnatural contractions that are Pitocin contractions, um, that I wanted an epidural. And almost like the instant I said that, I lost all of my coping strategies. I was just like, how do I deal with this? Like, it felt overwhelming. It felt like bigger than life. So I was confident in my choice, needed an epidural because I definitely needed rest if I was gonna push this baby out of me. So the new, um, the new shift, epidural, my epidural came in at 7.30. I was the first person that they got in that day and she was really funny. She was like um, telling me how she's sort of a lightweight when it comes to anesthesia and her friends when she had surgery was like, you should get an anesthesia discount because we use like a third of the medicine. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I should get that too because they put the test dose in me and I was like, I can't feel my butt. <laughs> and like almost instantaneously was numb. But she did listen to me because I told her to be very, very conservative with it. And she was, and I was able to actually move my right side pretty, pretty well. There was a moment there that like could not get my right side to cooperate. <laughs> But my left side, um, yeah, I think my left side was numb or could move. I don't remember. But I, I remember like it feeling a lot different than when I had my ECV, when, at, which was um, when they tried to turn Cecilia when she was still in my stomach. Um, they gave me a walking epidural and told me they would give me the lowest dose possible based on my weight and my height. And... Uh, I couldn't walk for five and a half hours. It was terrible. So she listened to me. It was really nice. Um, they checked me. So they, they kicked up my Pitocin to 15. They checked me at 4.30 p.m. and I was four centimeters. <laughs> so not a big change. One centimeter for like an entire day's worth of Pitocin. Um, I had a an elevated temperature. I wrote slight fever, but it wasn't really a fever. They don't consider it. And the fetal heart rate was uh, elevated as well. They were still trying new things. They put me on oxygen. They were really trying to keep all of those symptoms under control so that I could have my V back, which I felt like they were really working hard 
with what I wanted to happen. Um, I got checked again at 7 p.m. and I was still four centimeters. At this point, I had a new OB on call who was the OB that, that ended up doing my C-section. She started talking to me about the risk of hemorrhaging. Um, she told me that I had about two hours to make a plan and we were gonna go, go from there and that I might be a C-section. Right before that, when they checked me at 4.30 and they were like, you're still four centimeters, I was like, I'm probably gonna get a C-section. I started talking to my doula about like, I don't feel like a failure. I don't feel like I'm copping out at all because I went through labor, um, coped as best as I could with the unnatural Pitocin contractions. I um, got an epidural, so I, you know, was had a peanut between my knees, and I was going back and forth. And when I got my epidural, by the way, I slept all day. <laughs> like, I don't think I talked to my nurse that day at all. Um, yeah, I might have some clips, and I'll definitely enter them in where they're appropriate. But I was just asleep all day long. My husband has my son, so I'm not worried about his little squawking and crying and whatnot um so I already came to terms with like okay c-section and that was at 4 30 I was like okay c-section might happen um yeah and then the new OB was fine like I didn't have any issues with her um when I started talking to the nurses I heard I overheard them talk to each other like oh dr. so-and-so is not gonna be happy with this because it was close to midnight when I was like ready for my emergency c-section I guess um, because my midwife came in right after the elevated temp and right after my the new OB came in to tell me that I might be getting a c-section and she was like let me check you let's see how aggressive we could be with this we are monitoring you to kingdom come so like nothing bad is gonna happen and so she checked me and she was like, you're like four and a half, stretchy, out to a five. Let's, let's be super aggressive with the Pitocin. Let's get that V back. And I was like, okay. So I had like, I had this portion of time where I was coming to terms with C-section, which was fine. And then I had my new midwife who was like, you know what? You're gonna get your V back, let's do it. And then I had this whole new, like renewed a sense of hope, like this was going to happen, this was gonna be good. Um, so I was on board, of course I was on board because I wanted, I wanted it, I wanted a V-back. So then fast forward to about 11 p.m., my temperature could not get under control, his heart rate could not get under control, and that's when my midwife I mean, she took it hard. She was she was a bit emotional about it, but she was like, "Honey, I'm sorry. You're gonna have a C-section." And I was like, "Like, don't apologize to me. Let's get this baby out." <laughs> um, I was feeling good. I was I had already come to terms with it, so I was fine. Um, and I overheard them talking at that point that doc, Doctor So and So uh, was not going to be happy, and. I think that's because she wanted to do the c-section before she went home to sleep and you know we stuck it out a little bit longer and it was close to midnight so at 11 p.m they called the the ob on call which who i've never seen before i before that day i could never i wouldn't have ever recognized her she was just she was nobody nobody had a relationship with um and they were like, oh, she wanted to, you know, get this done before she went home, but whatever, uh, she'll deal. And my husband actually ran into her in the hallway and was like, did you get some rest? And you know, he was raring to go. And she just kind of looked at him flatly and said, yep. So that was kind of weird and unprofessional, but you know, people don't like to get their sleep disrupted. So whatever. He didn't tell me this until way afterwards. So like, he wasn't stressing me out at all. He he handled it like a like a veteran. So then we told my nurse like it'd be pretty cool to have an Equinox baby. Can we? Because she told us it would take 45 minutes to prep me for the OR, which would get me right before midnight on the 20 
it would be soon to be the 22nd. And so I was like, can we stretch this out so that we can have an equinox baby? Um, September 22nd is equinox. And she was like, yeah, we could totally do that. That's totally fine. So, um, it was pretty easy to, she just sort of like left us alone for a little bit. And my husband got all dressed in his scrubs, his paper suit. Um, and they got me all prepped. The anesthesiologist came in and he was pretty nice to me. And he was talking about his wife's birth and stuff. And I, I felt very at ease. You know, I told him all of my concerns, very sensitive to anesthesia, all that stuff. So he knew what was what was up and then they wheeled me back. Um, so this part's hard. Um, they wheeled me back, of course, alone without my husband because they prep me first and then they bring him in right before they do the surgery. So I'm sitting there in, in this sterile, bright, cold room and I start shivering and shaking, which is kind of how I reacted when I had my C-section with Cecilia. Kind of shivery and shaking, and um, there was a pediatrics nurse, which is like their intensive care unit. Um, nurse, not nurse, doctor, sorry, there. And she was wonderful. She was like tending to me while everything else was going on. She's like, are you cold, honey? Let me get you a warm blanket. Like, kind of mothering me. It was, it was very nice. And very well received. I, I enjoyed that sort of interaction because the rest of the interactions that I was overhearing were terrible. Um, the uh, doctor was sort of just patronizing to the, all of the nurses and telling them in excruciating detail where the sterile field was. Blue drapes mean sterile. Um, and I kind of started having a panic attack at that point, thinking, oh my gosh, these nurses have never seen a C-section before. They've never been in the OR. Like, I'm getting a bunch of interns doing this. And like, whew, it scared me. I knew that this was a teaching hospital too. Like, I had to sign papers that were like, I'm okay with students coming in. So in like a brief moment, I was like, these are all students that are doing this. So crazy that there aren't anybody there aren't any people here that actually have done this before. So she's still, you know, very patronizing and very condescending to this nurse, telling her how to pass the baby to me through the sterile field and what's sterile and what's not. And just like all of these things that kind of freaked me out. So at that point, you know, not a full blown panic attack, just started my breathing. I started like, breathing, my zen, breathing. <laughs> and then I was just waiting for my husband. Uh, shortly thereafter, my husband came in and he was whisked over to my side and he was holding my hand and I felt this sense of calm. Um, and then I, I didn't hear anything else, but they did start cutting me open. Um, there was no communication with me at all. I, I didn't know when they were starting to cut, what was going to happen next, what they were seeing, what they were concerned about, nothing. Like, all I heard was either silence or the OB yelling at the nurses. And um, uh, there was a, a point there where um, they hit some sort of blood artery vein thing um, that started spraying blood and a nurse got shot in the face with my blood and even my husband said that he had little splatters on him. I didn't know this. I didn't know what was going on. Um, thank goodness. I say thank goodness but I also felt like because of the tension in the room that I was probably gonna die. Um, I felt this intense pressure. Um, they were pushing near my rib cage, uh, from what I could tell, and it felt like I definitely couldn't breathe through them, um, and it was scary. I felt like this lady is gonna crack my ribs, like she's gonna puncture a lung for sure because my body can't handle that much pressure, like it wasn't tugging and pulling like I felt with Cecilia. 
Um, it was, it was like somebody was stopping my breathing. So, um, definitely started losing it, um, in the OR and tried really hard to get under control because I was just like, um, my teeth were chattering and I was, uh, uh, I want to say hyperventilating, but like my breathing was all weird. Um, I definitely couldn't control my breathing because of the weird pressure on my rib cage and on my body. So it was a lot harder to stay in control of that. Um, then I hear the uh, doctor start requesting uh, vacuum suction and I hear like the pumping sound uh, the pumping sound and then the nurse would scream green and then the uh, doctor I assume uh, would place the suction thing on the baby and try and she tried 10 times uh, 10 pop-offs are what the nurses would say to each other when they were talking about my um, c-section and a lot of them were like that's unheard of that's crazy that it was so or he was so stuck sorry excuse me um and then she started yelling at the nurse she started yelling at the tech before that um that she needed a new tech scrubbed in immediately and she was kicking this guy out or girl i don't even know who it was never heard them speak um, I didn't hear many people speak except for the doctor and so she was just barking orders you know get this new guy scrubbed in get a new tech get out of my OR like really upset at these people and then she started yelling um, at the nurse who was helping her with the pump um, and screaming at her no you don't touch that or you don't do that until I tell you to um, just barking orders at people and uh, screamed at this other lady that's not your job don't touch that like um freaked me out for sure thought this this or is complete chaos i'm for sure gonna lose my life here so i kept thinking like wow september 22nd is gonna be the day i die and the day my son's born. <laughs> so all of this is happening very much internally. I I couldn't find my voice. I didn't have a voice at that point. I was just holding on to my, my husband's hand. And while they were having difficulty getting him out, it took... Um, probably close to 15 minutes. The, my husband talked to the, to the, to the doctor afterwards and he said it was like 15 minutes and she argued with him that it was closer to eight minutes and you know, it took longer in his mind because he was staring at the clock. Um, but I think he was not staring at the clock. I think that he understood what time he came into the OR and what time he was born. So, um, Anyway, uh, whew. so all of these like terrible thoughts are going through my head and uh, I don't hear a baby cry right away. Um, I don't even know that he knew that he was born until they must have said like he's out, but I did not hear anything until the anesthesiologist told me to look over to my left and I looked over at this group of people, fuzzy people, and I didn't see my son cry or hear him cry until later. And then I heard a couple cries and then it went silent again. And I knew that um, from I think the pediatrician that he had, he had aspirated, breathed in a bunch of blood. And so he was having breathing issues. and. My daughter breathed in meconium and had breathing issues. So I knew that they were gonna put him on oxygen and um, all that stuff. So uh, that didn't freak me out that much. Like, okay, fine. Why isn't he crying though? Like, this is weird. And uh, 
the room was just silent. It was, it was stifling. It was um, intense. And the nurses asked my husband if they, if he wanted to cut the cord. And I told him no, which is, it was because I selfishly wanted him to be with me when I died. <laughs> because I thought that was going to happen. And so I told him no. And he said no thanks. Like, he, he wasn't weird about it at all, even though um, it was definitely weird of me to be like, you can't go over to our son. <laughs> But he handled it like he knew, <laughs> like he knew what was going on in my mind or something. It's almost like we've been married for 11 years. <laughs> so he um, stayed with me and then they told him, we have to take, we have to take your son to pediatrics, the intensive care thing for at least six hours because of the breathing issues. Um, do you want to come with? And again, they told him no, because I thought I was going to die and they had no one. I had no one in that OR that was on my side. Um, you know, I had this OB that I had never met before who um, was dealing with such incompetent people. Like, I, I just needed, I needed my husband there. And then I felt this like, weird sensation, almost like my organs were being rearranged because they were, and I heard the OB say that was her uterus going back in, and um, it made me feel woozy, um, and then she told the anesthesiologist, she didn't talk to me, um, that this was going to be a while and to put me to sleep. So. Again, did not have a voice um, at all, but the decision was made for me to put me to sleep. Let me rewind just a little bit because during the C-section, I started to feel burning on my right side and I told the anesthesiologist, but this was before my son was even born. And he's like, you know, I'm gonna give you some medicine. You're gonna go to sleep and then you'll have a beautiful boy. And I was like, no, I haven't seen my baby. Like, do not put me to sleep. <laughs> um, but then they ended up putting me to sleep after he was out and on his way to pediatrics. Um, so, uh, so then they put me to sleep, but they weren't really talking to me or if they were, I could not hear them but they put this uh, plastic rubber mask over my face and the air that was coming in was so thick, like not oxygen, something else, but I was trying to breathe and I realized at that point, like, oh, they're gonna suffocate me before they chop me up into pieces. Like, I don't know what was happening, but it felt like they were gonna suffocate me before they did whatever they were doing. Um, and I tried to take a deep breath and I couldn't. So I realized in that second, I needed to slow my breathing down like a lot. And so I did. And then I felt him start touching my throat and just like pushing on that really sensitive part of your throat, just pushing and pushing. And I felt like, is he gonna decapitate me? <laughs> Suffocate me, decapitate me, chop me up into little pieces and then, you know, that was how I was going to go. <laughs> uh, I just didn't understand what was happening. And the whole time, I just felt like there was a huge communication breakdown, which is part of the reason why this was so traumatic for me, is with Cecilia's C-section, my OB was talking to me the whole time. It was a light and happy atmosphere, even though she aspirated meconium. Um, they, they talked me through everything, the, the initial cut, sewing it up, they were, they were good about everything. Um,
uh, was reached. Really crappy room. Um, maybe he's in pediatrics. Everything's gonna be okay. And that's like the first time, <laughs> the only time that I, I tried to believe that everything was actually gonna be okay. <laughs> um, it was reassuring even though she had no idea. She had no clue what I had just gone through and how I felt in the war. But those few words like it made a big difference to me. I felt like this calm, this release. Of course I was on all these drugs, so there was that too. Um, and then my husband and the doula just kept switching back and forth and he would bring me pictures of, of Frederick and he had this, I shared them on Instagram, but he had a lot of head trauma, a lot of bruising on his head. Oh, they also use forceps. I don't know if I, I did tell you about that after the vacuum, but they use forceps too. And he had a huge bruise around his, um, the nose bridge area and his eyelid. Um, and it's still a bit red still. Um, and then he had a huge hematoma on the back of his head. So I'm not sure, they say that he was sunny side up and the OB came in and explained that um, he was really wedged into my pelvis and she said that there's probably something wrong with my pelvis um, because my first baby was breech and he was sunny side up and every time I had a contraction, like if this is my cervix up here, he was moving his head up um, like that. So I I'm not sure exactly what to believe, but I know that in my right state of mind, I would have been very offended if somebody, if an OB came in and said, something's wrong with you. <laughs> um, I would have been like, shut up, <laughs> just leave me alone, get out of here. Um, but I do think that he was in the wrong position and he wasn't putting pressure on my cervix enough to dilate me. So even though I was on a bunch of Pitocin, I think I got up to 19 maybe, um, even if I had all that Pitocin, it still wasn't being effective. It wasn't working with my body at all. So, um, then she said, because he was so wedged in there, um, she made the horizontal uh, bikini cut and then realized she needed more room and so she cut up towards my belly button. And so she said something to the effect, there will be no V-backs for you in the future, you will always be a cesarean. Um, and that was really hard, and it is hard. It is hard to, to know that I have, I have no control over that. Oh. Oh. So much of my journey has been a fight. A fight to get pregnant, stay pregnant, and a fight to have the birth I desire. And now, because of this incision going up, I don't have a choice. Yeah, so, so that's it. That's, um, that was the delivery portion of <laughs> my labor and delivery story. Um, Frederick was relatively healthy except for, um, his bilirubin levels were elevated. He didn't have jaundice, but his bilirubin levels were elevated due to the bruising, um, because any sort of bruising elevates bilirubin levels, and also his blood type and my blood type don't mix. <laughs> there are antibodies in the O positive uh, blood that don't work well with the A positive that he is. And so he had elevated bilirubin levels and was on the bilirubin therapy, light therapy lamp, 
and blanket and um he was on like a prescribed amount of formula in the hospital even though this was day one day two um they put him on 30 milliliters which is an ounce of a formula per feeding and so they were like the nurses understood like just how ridiculous it was because they were like this is 24 hours out like of course you're not going to be making an ounce like give your body some time um but let's just get some fluid in him because they wanted to flush him out they wanted him to pee out and poop out all of the the stuff in there and after the light therapy and the formula feeding um his bilirubin levels started to decline so he's relatively healthy minus the bruising that you guys may have saw on the pictures may have seen on the pictures sorry <laughs> uh, and yeah since then i have had major issues healing my um vertical incision uh, I start. I got the staples because she used dissolving stitches down below and then staples up. She used 25 staples up. And I got the 25 removed and then I started having um, like some discharge around the incision and then one Sunday morning I woke up and I was wearing like a a maxi pad but it was going up on my belly um, so that I could see what was being discharged and make sure the color was okay and you know all that stuff uh, and then one Sunday morning I woke up and there was a line of blood so my incision had opened just really gross anyway we went to the ER my husband was awesome and called the on-call OB and they were like you know, don't drive an hour away, go to the ER that's in your town. And so we went there and uh, long story short, <laughs> I had to go back to my clinic uh, almost a week after they removed the staples for the OB to reopen my incision. Ugh, makes me want to vomit. So reopen the top part of my incision. Um, just the vertical part and see if my tissue was alive and healthy or if it had died if it was infected all this stuff so I went in that Wednesday after the Sunday and um, he reopened it and I started having like pretty big panic attacks like when they even removed the staples I was having a panic attack because anything to do with the incision made me relive everything that happened in the OR. Whew. Um, so I thought like for sure my incision was going to kill me. I was going to have a staph infection. My insides were going to be all disgusting and dead and I would have to have more surgery and all this other stuff. And so I, I was definitely suffering from some PTSD type um, things and when he opened it up I was I was a mess I was crying so hard uh, I was crying so hard but trying to like stifle it that I was like plugging up my ears I remember like oh my gosh I'm gonna make myself deaf like busting an eardrum trying to hold in my my crying <laughs> um, but that wasn't painful the whole reopening the incision thing was painful um, and he ended up finding a seroma, which is a buildup of the serum part of your blood. And it's just like white blood cells that rush to the area. It's, um, it, it was basically healing, like my organs were healing up into the fascia and then in the adipose tissue, which is just the fat layer. Um, it had this big, big pocket of serum or uh, yeah serum um and that is what's called the seroma and it had this like little bottleneck area that scooped out and so what my my ob did was he cut me open he gave me lidocaine for uh part of it and he 
drained it, flushed it out, and then packed it full of gauze like material and told me I had to come back every single day until he got me into this wound clinic. And so a couple days later, I got in to the wound clinic and they, it was kind of funny. My nurse was like, you know, you'll be seen once a week, you're fine. We usually don't put wound vax on C-section uh, incision issues, so like you're fine. And this was before she even like looked at it. And then she looked at it and was like, you're gonna be seen three times a week and we're gonna try to give you a wound vac today. <laughs> like she was really <laughs> uh, proactive and everything. But the, um, the nurse practitioner was like, you know, let's not give her a wound vac and then send her off on the weekend. Let's have her get the wound vac on Monday. So they had to repack it with all the gauze and stuff and then teach my husband how to redress it because there's no way in hell that I was gonna touch it. Um, still haven't touched it or really seen it. Um, but at that time it was eight centimeters deep um and i think six centimeters wide at the biggest i'm not sure exactly what the uh the width was but it was large i've been keeping track of the depth mostly because that makes me weak in the knees and makes me want to vomit everywhere um so I've had the wound back on for, I had it for about a week or exactly a week. And um, the last time I went in, which was yesterday, it was 1.5 centimeters deep. And so I got the wound back taken out and now I'm just packed with like um, a little bit of like fancy magic gauze that dissolves and a huge flower band-aid. <laughs> it's not a real flower, it's like just bubbly. Um, I call it my flower band-aid to Cecilia, who understands just a little bit that mommy has a cut. Um, so yeah, tomorrow I get to return my wound vac, which is so awesome, if everything is healing right. And I think that it, I think that it's going fairly well. I'm not bleeding or anything, so that's good. Um, the wound vac was a little, um, I guess embarrassing to carry around because it constantly made this like look 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 noise and then every once in a while <laughs> fart noise so <laughs> as much as I love potty humor poop jokes all that stuff not really a fan of drawing attention to myself with a fart machine attached to me and then this tube going through down into my skirt. So it was weird and I didn't like it. Um, but it did its job. I went from eight centimeters to 1.5. Yes. So I am, I guess on the mend. I remember coming home from the hospital and talking to my mother-in-law about making this labor and delivery video. And I said, I just feel like my story's not over yet. Like there's something else that's gonna happen. And you know, that was before I got the staples removed and before I had to go to the ER and all that stuff. So now I kind of feel like there's nothing, there's nothing else that can happen, that could possibly happen. Um, knock on wood. So hopefully everything goes well. Frederick has been amazing. Uh, since he was bottle fed from, you know, day one, he really wouldn't latch on very well to just me. So I've been using the nipple shield and recently I took away the nipple shield and he did latch. Um, it was painful, just kind of how it is in the beginning, sort of need to toughen yourself up. And I told my wound clinic nurse and she was like, you know, your body's already going through a lot of pain. So if you want to like postpone <laughs> getting rid of the nipple shield, like don't be so hard on yourself, you could do that. And that's all it took for me to realize like, why am I torturing myself? Um, I'm already in so much pain, sitting down, getting up, I've been sleeping in a recliner. Thank God my, my father-in-law found this recliner for us. We moved it upstairs into our bedroom and I've been sleeping in a lazy boy next to the bed because sleeping in the bed, it, it became impossible. Um, 
using your ab muscles, getting up like that just wasn't working. So I've been sleeping in this lazy boy, which thank God we have that option, but it's definitely not very restful for my head and my neck and my shoulders and my arms and you know it's just not the same so it's not the same kind of rest and i haven't been able to like get up and change a diaper and get everything ready to go um without the help of my husband which thank god for him because i i don't know what i would do um whew, so it's been hard because I sort of lost all of my autonomy. I couldn't do things on my own um, for so long. And like, I don't realize how stubborn I am, but <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's hard to lose. It's hard to lose so much of yourself and so much independence. Like you just can't, you can't physically do it. So that's been rough, but hopefully that is soon to be in my past. And I hope that I am healed better by, by tomorrow and things will be good. <laughs> okay, so that was my super long <laughs> labor and delivery story. We are alive. We are relatively well. My son is well <laughs> and I am healing. All right, guys, love you, and um, I probably won't update uh, anytime soon. So I hope you guys have a good one. Bye.